we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. What is it that brings about a culture totally different from the mechanistic culture we have accepted for thousands of years? Hello and welcome to episode 188 of Urgency of Change. Each episode of the Krishnamurti podcast is compiled from carefully chosen extracts from the archives, representing Krishnamurti's different approaches to many of the fundamental issues and questions we all face in our lives. This week's theme is culture. Upcoming themes are resistance, being and becoming, and power. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please visit the official YouTube channel for hundreds of advert-free, full-length video and audio recordings of Krishnamurti's talks. In addition, the Foundation's own channel features hundreds of specially selected clips. You can also find our regular Krishnamurti quotes and videos on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, which helps our visibility. This week's episode on culture has five sections. This first extract is from Krishnamurti's sixth talk in Ojai, 1982, titled, What is Culture? We're asking, what is culture? Is it merely the mechanical repetition of the known? Which is, we live in the past. The past is our memory. The past is our knowledge through experience. And we live always in the past, in the known. And when we act from the known, it is repetitive. We must act in certain areas with knowledge, like a scientist. He has to have a great deal of knowledge, or a great surgeon must have experience, he must have operated upon many, accumulated knowledge, skill, and the sensitivity of hand, and there knowledge is necessary. And knowledge, which is all our remembrances, all the past incidents, the hurts, the fears, the longings, the despairs, the desperate loneliness, all that's part of our past knowledge. And when we are acting from the past, it must be repetitive. And though, therefore, the mind becomes mechanical. The computer is a repetitive machine, maybe quicker, faster than the human brain. But it but the machine is repetitive, as we human beings are. And so we are questioning any culture born 
from the past, from the known, obviously is mechanical, repetitive. And so we are asked, going to find out what is it that brings about a culture which is totally different from the mechanistic culture which we have accepted for thousands of years. Most of our minds, with some rare exceptions, are mediocre. Forgive me if I use that word. One may think one is extraordinarily out of that class, but to think that you are out of that class is also a form of mediocrity. (laughs) This is not an insult. We are examining together. What is it to be mediocre? The word mediocre comes from Greek Latin, climbing half way up the mountain. That's the real meaning of that word (laughs) mediocre. Never climbing all the way up, but being satisfied to climb halfway or one third of the way. That's the meaning of that word, mediocre. And our education, however wide, whatever knowledge one acquires through in a particular subject, it is all these factors of education are limiting the mind. Have you noticed how, especially in this country which is spreading this fact all over the rest of the world, how specialists, scientific specialists, the doctors, the surgeons, the philosophers, the psychologists and so on, they are ruling each one of us. They have the authority to tell you what to do. They are the experts how to bring up a baby, how to have sexual relationship properly, how to make up your face. They are these authorities and we all obey them. Our obedience has, at certain times, a revolt, but the, that revolt is merely a reaction, and so it's not complete comprehension of the understanding that all specialized knowledge is limited, as all knowledge is limited, and a culture born out of this limitation is no culture at all. There is no American culture or European culture. They can go back to the Renaissance, to the past history, but deep culture of the mind can only come about through freedom from the known. Can there be such freedom? The second extract is from the second talk in Sarnen, 1973, titled Trapped in this culture, how am I to change? Seeing what the world is about us and what we are actually, not theoretically, (coughs) 
What a world we have created, a world of great brutality, division, wars, appalling cruelties, <coughs> suffering. Seeing all this, one feels, if one is at all serious, that there must be great change, not only outwardly, but especially within oneself. I do not know if you feel the same thing as the speaker does. How very important it is that there should be this psychological revolution. Because every other form of revolution, social reform, little patchwork here and there, has been of no avail. They haven't fundamentally, deeply changed man. And, then, and unless man changes himself, he always overcomes whatever the structure be according to his particular conditioning. I think that's fairly obvious, both historically and actually. And if you also feel the urgency, the seriousness of this change, of this transformation, of this revolution, you must have asked, how is a human mind which has created the outward environment, how can that not merely structurally, but how can the outward change be brought about in relation to the inward change? That is, if you see the necessity of this deep inward change of the mind, and if you take it really seriously, then the question inevitably arises, how am I caught in this world, trapped in this peculiar culture and civilization? How am I to fundamentally change? And what is involved in this change? I'm sure you must have asked it. The more serious one is, the more urgent the question becomes. Can this change be brought about by another? By a philosophy? By a new kind of social structure, by a new religion, or by a new belief. When you put that question to yourself, you have seen whether a new belief has any validity at all. 
Because all belief, however great, however convenient, is always the outcome of a series of processes of thought. I believe in something, a beautiful ideal. That ideal is the structure brought about by thought, obviously. When you believe in or have faith in something, it is the result of the process of mentation. Will a new structure, socially, economic, will that change the human mind? Or will it make it more superficial, more convenient, more attractive, more satisfying? and therefore will not actually bring about this change. Will a new authority? Obviously not, because any authority, whether however new, is still patterned after the old. So what will change man? And what is there to be changed? If one observes oneself, we are caught in a world of knowledge, of a culture, of a civilization, which has conditioned our mind. Our conditioning is the result of a culture, of a civilization. The Western culture Eastern culture, and so on. That is the result of our conditioning. The culture, the environment, the civilization has produced this mind. I think that we all accept that. Naturally, and logically, if you observe it. Now, what am I to do as a human being living in this world, a monstrous world, with very little meaning, what am I to do? How am I to transform myself? How am I to change radically? (coughs) Because I see I have to change radically. Because everything about me, the way I live, walking, 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 frightened, violence, wars, insecurity, all the religious structure which has no meaning at all anymore, the political chicanery, corruption, 
seeing all this. <coughs> How am I to change so that it has an effect on the world and also my conduct, my behaviour, my way of living is totally different. Now, is this your problem? If it is not, we can't share it. Sharing means to share something together in which we are vitally interested deeply concerned, totally committed. If we have a motive in sharing, then it's not possible to share. If I have a motive and you have a motive, which must be obviously be different, how can we share together a problem? And the problem is the transformation of the total activity of man. If you are vitally interested in it, seriously committing, committed to the solution of this problem, that is, how can the mind which has been shaped through time, through culture, through civilizations, how can that mind be totally be transformed so that it moves, acts, functions in a different way altogether. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's fourth talk in Sanan, 1973, titled Our Culture is Based on Pleasure. Let's proceed to find out if there is a meaning to life. Because it is necessary, absolutely necessary. Because modern culture or ancient culture have imposed on us certain values, certain Moralities. The religious structure has given us a background of a purpose, heaven and hell, you know, all that. Now, a mind that is really very serious, and we are here for that purpose. We are serious, at least some of us. I hope so. As we said, this is not an entertainment. Intellectual, verbal, or religious entertainment. The speaker is very serious. And if you are also very serious, then we can meet together, we can talk over together, share together. Now, how are you going to find out what is the purpose of life? Because when once you discover it as a reality, not as an idea, as something somebody else has projected, or you yourself have projected. 
But if you can discover the, for yourself the purpose of the meaning of life, the meaning, the significance, the depth, the beauty, then it has a relationship with regard to your actions, with regard to your relationship with another, with regard to your whole living. So how do we begin to inquire what is the meaning of life? Will thought reveal it? Thinking about it, rationalizing, discussing, and trying to find out the truth through opinion, which is dialectic. You may have an opinion of what the meaning of life is, and another may have another meaning. And through exchange of opinions, reason, can you come upon the truth of what is the meaning of life? You're following? We are taking a journey together into this matter. You're not merely listening to a speaker, to a lot of words or ideas or imaginations. We're actually together sharing this problem, seriously. So through opinions, you cannot find it. So you have to discard opinions. Right? Can you discard it? Actually. If you have, then can you find it through very careful analysis? Analysis, as we explained the other day, is a process of paralysis, right? Paralysis through analysis. We went into that the other day. And can you discover it through the movement of time as thought? Please, are you following all this? Am I making... Right. Is it a matter of time? That is, investigating through the process of thinking what others have said, or through careful rationalization which thought can do excellently, objectively. So, can thought reveal the meaning of life? Thought, as we said, 
is the movement within the area of time. Thought is time. And our brain and the whole structure of our mind is based on time. So we have these problems. Opinion, what others have said, whether it's Mao, uh, Lenin, uh, various saviors, gurus, intellectuals, you accept them or reject them, or through the capacity of a mind that can think very clearly and logically and say to itself, this is the meaning of life. Can thought do that? Thought being the response of memory, knowledge, experience, which is the past. So can the past reveal the full meaning of life? You understand this? We have got these three things, which are really one, but doesn't matter. We'll, for the moment, we'll look at them separately. Opinion, what others have said, the saints, the saviors, the mm, teachers, the books, and your own thought. So can you depend on your thought, and you may be not perfectly balanced. Most of us are slightly neurotic. And can you depend on what others have said? Doesn't matter who it is. The Bible, the, Indian, the Indian books, and so on, so on. Or can and also can you depend on your own thinking? Have you sufficient confidence? That's in the world. Have you sufficient knowledge which you have put in put it to test to find out? You've understood? So we can reject opinion. What others say what you should, what your, the, what the life, the meaning of life to you, what others have said. It's only the fools who advise. So you can reject that without any, uh, too much thought. Then can you look at your culture, of which you are a part, the culture that says the meaning of life is this, work endlessly in the office, in the factory, and bear the responsibility of a family, And your culture says, well, you see, in this culture, in Western culture or Eastern culture, it doesn't matter, all cultures are more or less the same, says that you will live in heaven if you're good on earth. And that's the meaning 
of life, going to heaven. And also your culture says, why bother what the meaning of life is? Just live. Put up with the ugliness, the beastly existence, the sorrow, the pain, the anxiety, the pleasures, the fears, the utter boredom, the loneliness. Put up with it. That's part of your life. You can't go beyond it. Therefore, enjoy. Therefore, make pleasure as the main thing of your life. Right? And that's what you're doing. So we are asking, is pleasure the full meaning of life? And that's what you, you are want. That's what you are seeking. A permanent, enduring, continuous pleasure. Right? Not only sexually, but also in your relationship with others. The pleasure which you derive in work, in fulfillment, in becoming ambitious, achievement, success, in possession either of ideas or of things. Right? So, the principle of pleasure is for most people the meaning of life. Right? Don't, please, let's be terribly honest. We can so easily deceive ourselves. And in the pursuit of pleasure, fulfillment becomes extraordinarily important. Sexually, fulfillment of your desires, fulfillment to be somebody important, famous. Successful, all that. Now, is pleasure the full, deep meaning to la of life? Which is what you want, right? Is that the meaning of life? If you accept that as you do, that is the meaning of life, the fulfillment, the self-aggrandizement, the sexual pleasures, the pleasure of competition, success, wanting to be known as the self-importance, self-centered activity, all that gives pleasure. If that is the meaning of life, then life becomes terribly Superficial, doesn't it? And that's what we have done.
follow this. That's what we have done, actually. We have made life in the pursuit of pleasure very superficial. Haven't you noticed it? Huh? You may be very clever, you may be a great artist, pianist, or uh, whatever you are, techn- expert, a good or swindling politician, whatever it is. But it's all on the surface. So, knowing that it is superficial life, then you ask, Is there not a deeper meaning of the having made life superficial in the pursuit of pleasure, then we, as a reaction to that, we say life must have a much deeper meaning. So we begin to investigate the deeper meaning, which is joining sects. Follow all this. Joining groups, investigating into occultism, into telepathy, extrasensory perception, you know, all the things, give, hoping to give life a deeper meaning. Right? Mm. Look at yourself in your mirror. And when you are doing that, naturally, gurus spring up like mushrooms. And that indicates degeneracy. Then you become, if you are a Catholic, you drop that and you become a Hindu. If you are a Hindu, you drop that and become something else and play this game endlessly, thinking you are digging very, very deeply. But your intention is the pursuit of pleasure. So, is pleasure in different forms, you understand, not one form, the the whole contents of pleasure, which expresses itself in different ways, the, 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 the quality of it. Is that the meaning of life? If it is, then you depend on others, right? Sexually, you are attached to others. You cannot possibly stand alone. Intellectually, you must be stimulated. Entertained. You must have companionship. You are afraid of your loneliness. So, property, things become extraordinarily important. your houses, your furniture, the property, land. And if you have no land, property, things, then you have things of the mind. 
I hope you're following all this. Your beliefs, your ideals, your experiences, the visions that you have, So where there is the where pleasure is the principle is the full meaning of life, then you must depend on things and therefore from that comes fear. I don't know if you're following all this. If I depend on you for my pleasure, physically, psychologically, intellectually, or so-called spiritually, in that dependence there is anxiety, there is fear, there is incessant sense of insecurity. I, right? Do look at it, for God's sake, look at it. And that is your life. Fear, the sense of loneliness because you depend on others, which you have covered it up through dependence, and when that dependence is shaken you become anxious, jealous, furious, hated, hateful, antagonistic, violent. Those are all the issues of the pursuit of pleasure. That is your culture. Of which, of which you are. And you are the world and the world is you. The fourth extract is from the third talk in Sanin, 1971, titled Culture Has Conditioned the Observer. Now, let us examine what the observer is. If you have the energy to go on with this. What is the observer? Surely the observer is the past. The past, be it yesterday or a few seconds ago, or the past of many, many, many uh, years. Many years as a, as a cultured, conditioned entity, living in a particular culture, Right? The observer is the past. The observer is the total sum of past experiences. The observer is knowledge. Isn't it? When I say, I know you because I met you yesterday. When I say I am a Hindu, Catholic, Protestant, um, Communist, um, Muslim, it's the past. I've been conditioned in the culture in which I have been brought up. So the observer is the past. Right? This is obvious, isn't it? Do you dispute this fact? The observer is not, is within the field of time, to make it a little more complex. 
the observer is the past which through the present modifies the future. And the future is still the observer. No? When he says, I will be that, he has projected that from the past knowledge, either of pleasure, pain, suffering or delight, fear and so on, and says, I must become that. That is, the past, going through the present which becomes modified, the future, which is a projection of the past. Right? So the observer is the past. That is, you live in the past, don't you? Huh? Just think of it. You are the past and you live in the past. And that's your life, right? Past memories, past delights, past remembrances, the things that you have enjoyed, the things you've... and the failures, the lack of fulfillment, the misery, the... everything is in the past. And through the eyes of the observer, you begin to judge the present, the thing that is living, moving. Right? Are we going together? So, when I look at myself, I am looking with the eyes of the past. And therefore I condemn, judge, evaluate, say it's right, wrong, this good, this bad, right? According to the culture, the tradition, the knowledge, the experience which the observer has gathered. Therefore, it prevents the observation of the living thing which is the me. And that me may not be me at all. I only know the me as the past. I don't know if you're following me. When the Muslim says he is a Muslim, he is the past, conditioned by the culture in which he has been brought up. Or the Catholic community. You follow? The whole thing is based. So, uh, when we talk about living, we are talking about living in the past. And therefore, there is conflict between the past and the present. Because I am conditioned as a Muslim or God knows what, and I cannot meet the living present which demands that I break down my conditioning. And my conditioning is deliberately brought about by my fathers, grandfathers, you know, keep me in the narrow line of their belief, of their tradition, of their mischief, of their misery. Right? This is what we are doing all the time. Not only the conditioning of the pa by the past, the culture in which we have lived, but also by every incident, experience happening, we, are being, um, we live in the past. I see a beautiful sunset and I say, how marvelous that is. Ah, look at the light, the shadows, the rays of the sun, the, the green light, the hills. And it has been stored up, as it's stored, and that memory acts tomorrow. It says, I must look at that sun again, find out that beauty. <coughs> and therefore I can't find it, struggle to find it. Go to a museum, you follow, the whole circus begins.
Now, can I look at myself with the eyes that have never been touched by time? Time involves analysis, time involves holding on to the past, time involves this whole process of dreaming, recollection, you follow? Gathering past and holding all that. Can I look at myself without the eyes of time? Put that question to yourself. Don't say you can or cannot. You don't know. And when you look at yourself without the eyes of time, what is there to look, then to look? But don't answer me, please. You understand my question? I have looked at myself with the quality, the nature and the structure of time, hmm? the past. I have looked at myself through the eyes of the past. I have no other eyes to look at. I have looked at myself as a Catholic or something else, which is the past. So I, my eyes are incapable of looking at itself, at it, what is, without time, which is the past. Right? Now I'm asking a question, which is, can the eyes the observe, observe without the past? Now, let me put it differently. I have an image about myself, not only created by the culture in which I have lived, but also I have my own particular image of myself, apart from the culture. Don't we? We have great many images. I have an image about you, I have an image about my wife, my children, my political leader, my priest, and um, <clears throat> I have an image of what I should be, what I am not, and I have an image what the, the images which culture has imposed upon me. So I, I have quantities of images. Don't you have them? No? Delighted. Now, how can you look with, without an image? Because if you have, if you look with an image, it's a distortion. Obviously, isn't it? If I look at you with the image which I have of you, which has been put together because you are angry with me yesterday. You are angry with me yesterday and that has created an image about you, right? That you are not my friend anymore. You are ugly, you are this, you are that. Now, that image distorts the perception when I meet you next time, right? So that image is the past, and all my images are the past. And I don't get rid of any of those images, because I don't know what would be without an image. <coughs> so I cling to one or two images. So I dip, the mind depends on an image, for its survival. I wonder if you are following all this. <laughs> so
So can, I, can the mind observe without any image? Without the image of a tree, the cloud, the hills, the flowing waters, the image of my wife, my children, my husband, my aunt, not to have any relation, any image in relationship. It is the image that brings conflict, right? In relationship. I cannot get on with my wife because she has bullied me. That has been built up day after day, that image, that image prevents any kind of relationship. Perhaps we sleep together, that's irrelevant. And there's a fight. So, can the mind look, observe, without any image of time, any image that has been put together by time, The final extract in this episode is from Krishnamurti's third talk in Sanan, 1973, titled Intelligence Has Nothing to Do with Culture. Now, next question is, can the mind, freeing itself from its conditioning, which is the result of time, live in this world which is made up of, which has been brought about by the intricacies of thought as movement in time. Right? My question is, can a human being, freeing himself from his conditioning, freeing doesn't mean time, live in this world, earn a livelihood, and all the rest of it. I don't know if it is a problem to you. Is it any problem to any of you? Uh, wait, sir, let me make clear, very clear the problem. Total transformation of the human mind. The human mind as the result of the past of time, which has created this monstrous world, this ugly, brutal, violent, stupid, insane world, and I have produced this world because I, human beings are unbalanced, vicious, brutal, and all the rest of occasionally kind when it pays them, and so on. A total transformation of all that, that is, total unconditioning of the mind, can the mind, understanding this, seeing the truth of it, live in this world? You understand my question now? Not, after I have unconditioned myself, I will live in the world. But in the very act of freeing, not in the movement of freeing, which involves time, but in the very act of freeing, live in this world. That is, <coughs> My education, my culture, my civilization has dis hasn't given me intelligence. I mean by intelligence sensitivity, 
the highest form of sensitivity. It is impersonal. <coughs> it's not your intelligence or my intelligence <coughs> or the racial intelligence or the cultural intelligence. Intelligence has nothing to do with country, with culture, with religion, with persons. It is intelligence. Culture hasn't given me that. But in examining, in watching, in being aware of this conditioning, there is sensitivity to the movement of thought, of time, of all that. Out of that highest sensitivity comes intelligence. Now, that intelligence will operate when I am living in this world, totally transformed of, from the world. Are you meeting? <coughs> I've got totally, mind has got totally new instrument. <coughs> which is not the result of time. I wonder if you're following all this. That is, sir, freedom is not from something. Freedom is not freedom from conditioning. Freedom is to see the conditioning, to be aware of the conditioning, without the movement of thought, and out of that attention, awareness, comes freedom. So, a mind that has been educated wrongly through civilizations and culture cannot re-educate itself to a new culture, to a new state. All it can do is to see the falseness of this culture. When you see that which is false, then there is the truth in that falseness. <coughs> right? It is that truth, the, the perception of that truth is intelligence. <coughs> 